Well, Lee, um, this is at the end of a nearly 10-day trip to New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, which is probably not what you expected to be doing this time last year. Um, I decided to uh, invite you and try and make your trip possible, having heard you speak at a conference in Vermont in June last year um, on domestic violence and restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And because this is such a big issue in this country and there's a, a lot of attention being given to it at the moment, I know it's a big issue elsewhere as well, but it's, um, it's been given a lot of attention here. I thought it'd be just wonderful to have you come and be able to bring both your expertise in domestic violence and your interest in restorative justice to us. And I think you know, after 10 days of your trip, I think it's really, it's really worked extremely well. It's been really good to have you. Well, I'm glad you think so. <coughs> um, it's been amazing to be here. I've learned so much. Uh, it's been just a wonderful opportunity to exchange ideas. Mm. And so thank you for bringing me. So how did you get into working on domestic violence in the first place? <clears throat> As a law student, we had a student-run program uh, working with people to get protective orders in domestic violence cases. And I had thought that I wanted to do work with children, and I thought that that was the closest analog to that work, and began doing it in law school and fell in love with it. So what, what about it made you fall in love with it? So it's interesting what I, about it made me fall in love with it is not what I love about it anymore. Um, I fell in love with it because I thought that you could use the law to make people's lives appreciably different by separating them from their abusive partners. And so kind of, if I could get somebody divorced, that was the greatest thing that I could do for them. I don't think that way anymore, um, largely because I've had clients who said to me, you know, this isn't what I wanted and this divorce is not making me happy. I'm doing it because I have to, but it's not something that I ever imagined for myself. So now I love doing it because I have a set of skills that I can use to help people understand the processes that they're engaging with, to give them a greater set of options, and in some cases to make their lives better through the tools that the legal system offers us. So when did you first start thinking about restorative justice as part of those options, one of those options? I started thinking about restorative justice when I was working on my book, A Troubled Marriage. Um, partly because I was told that I couldn't just criticize the system, I had to actually come up with alternatives as well. And I started investigating restorative justice then. It appealed to me because it put power into the hands of people who had been abused to try to come up with solutions uh, that would better serve them than the solutions that we were offering people through the criminal justice system, which is the US's primary way of dealing with intimate partner violence. And because it engaged the community in ensuring accountability for offender behavior in ways that I thought we were doing very poorly. Right. So you, you, in a sense you're saying restorative justice offers the very things that many critics of restorative justice from the domestic violence sector rejected for, the issues of empowerment and of safety. Sure. So the big criticisms of restorative justice in the domestic violence world are safety, that women can't safely engage, and primarily we're talking about women. Um, accountability, that it doesn't sufficiently hold offenders accountable because it doesn't provide for criminal sanction. And reprivatization of violence, in that it takes violence out of the uh, public sphere where we've had it via the law for the last 40 years and puts it back into the private sphere. And I think all of those things are wrong. Um, I think that you have to be very careful about doing restorative justice in cases involving intimate partner violence, but that safety can mean a lot of things to people, um, and that physical safety can be secured. If people are ready to make a determination that they want to face their abusers, we shouldn't deny them that opportunity. That accountability means more than just criminal punishment, and that we can find accountability in lots of ways. And that community-based uh, remedies like restorative justice aren't reprivatizing. They're actually a different kind of public than we've conceived of previously. Yeah. So yeah, I would take on all of those critiques. So are you a lone voice in the US or <laughs> do you sense that the tide is turning and uh, domestic violence people are getting more interested in restorative justice? I think what's so interesting about it is that I, I wouldn't say I'm a lone voice, I think, but within the legal community there's a real resistance to restorative justice. What's interesting about the work that I've done is that the advocates, the intimate partner violence advocates who work on a day-to-day -day basis with clients and see how the system is not working are much more open to restorative justice right. than judges and lawyers and particularly prosecutors are. Um, and I think what that speaks to is a, an unwillingness to critique the legal system, an unwillingness to believe that you're not an essential part yeah. of justice. Um, 
within our legal community. So it's a bit of turf protection. A little bit, yeah. yeah. And a little bit of idealism. I think you don't, you want to see yourself as effective. And I think people really resist the idea that what they're doing isn't as effective as they might mm. think. To what extent do you think the critique of restorative justice and the dangers associated with it is hypothetical rather than real in the sense that people imagine this could be the outcome because the process appears to lend itself to that rather than something that really is a common problem in practice? Well, in the United States, it's hypothetical rather than real because people aren't doing restorative justice in cases involving intimate partner violence. Yeah. The effort is all around kind of precluding it from happening. But, you know, do I think that one of a, a case, a conference could go horribly wrong and something terrible could happen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I also know that people get protective orders and they go to court and they get criminal sanctions and they still get killed. So the idea that we are ever going to completely eliminate risk from any of these processes, including the legal system, yep, is ridiculous. Yep, yep. There's also a case, isn't it, where it's often the hardest cases that drive policy yeah. rather than the majority of cases. So, bad facts make bad law, yeah, is what we yep, say. Yeah, And so we imagine if the most extreme example we can think of couldn't possibly work with a restorative justice intervention, therefore the intervention itself must be a problem. Yeah, the other thing that I've talked a lot about um, with friends in the mediation context is, you know, in the domestic violence community, we've also said mediation can't work, here's why, same reasons as restorative justice. And a dear friend of mine, uh, Kelly Bro Olson, who is a mediator, said to me, you know, you're, and this is me, I was saying this, you know, 10, 15 years ago, said, you know, you're comparing the worst mediation with the best litigation, yeah, yeah. and you're assuming that you have a better system. And we have to stop doing that. Yeah, yeah, I remember reading that in your book. <laughs> so you've been with us in, Aotearoa for a week and a bit, and I know that first impressions are, are probably not always the most reliable way to judge a place, but what, what have you sensed being here around these questions? What's, has it been different? Has it been... I'm a little jealous. Yeah. Um, you're so far ahead of us in your thinking about restorative justice. Um, we are not in that place yet where it's a reality in any sense of the word. And so I'm, I'm jealous of kind of what you've accomplished. But I also, um, you know, I think there are pitfalls that are, that are, are possible. And you're at a really interesting place where in thinking about how you scale up restorative justice efforts that are going to involve intimate partner violence, there are some real things to be careful of. Um, and so I'm fascinated to see where it goes from here. Mm. But I've learned an enormous amount about the practice. And just in reading the standards that have been created for doing restorative practice in intimate partner violence cases, New Zealand is so far ahead of us in their thinking on those issues. Right. It seems to me that the way ahead is for much more cooperation between restorative justice facilitators, the restorative justice community, and the domestic violence sector. And I think at the conference we saw, I mean, a good foundation for that kind of cooperation. I think um, it seems that, that everybody was prepared to listen and engage together. What would, you, what would you recommend for advancing that cooperation? What would make it, what would be a good next step for us here, do you think? That's a really interesting question. Um, dialogue and dialogue and dialogue to understand what people's fears and concerns yep. are honest and open and respectful and understanding that there will be places where you probably will never necessarily agree, but to find that common ground. And I think that dialogue has to be kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis, not necessarily in large conference settings, but between restorative practitioners and family violence people in smaller settings that are places where ideas can get shared, concerns can get aired and people can try to find some resolution, it might be really interesting to use a conferencing method. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's a very restorative way it's of a proceeding. Very, it is, and it might yeah. be really interesting to use conferencing yeah. to, to yeah. facilitate those conversations. Yep. Um, and just to recognize that, that people generally come from a very good place, even when they're saying things that don't make sense to us particularly. So the reason that intimate partner violence people are so opposed to restorative justice is not all turf and it's not all misguided thinking, it's a sincere and mm. genuine concern for mm. the safety and well-being of the people that they work with you know, based on kind of some really horrible things that they have mm. seen and experienced. Yeah. And similarly, you know, RJ people aren't blindly taking you forward into restorative justice. They're thoughtful about 
and what those what the precautions need to be and we need to assume good intent on the part yeah, of everyone yeah, involved in those yeah. conversations. I think that's really important. We're all on the same side at the end of the Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, what's next for you in your <laughs> work agenda? I'm going to go home. I'm going to <clears throat> pay a lot of attention to my children. Um, I'm working on a project thinking about how far we can take this idea of decriminalizing domestic violence. So there's some conversation in the states around the ineffectiveness of the criminal justice response, and some folks are calling for prison abolition. Um, there's good reason to be skeptical about the ways in which the criminal justice system works, but there may be limitations as to how far we can take that idea. And I want to think about both the theory behind whether we could think about changing the way that we respond through the criminal justice system to domestic violence, and in practice, then what might replace that? So when you say decriminalization, do you mean removing it from the criminal law, or do you mean changing the way the criminal system engages with the problem? I think that's something that I have yet to work out. I think there's a distinction to be made between having something on the criminal books, on the criminal law books, and the way that we punish it. So yeah. part of what I'm really thinking about is, is what I want to do change the punishment structure, or is what I want to do say this is not a crime? Um, and I think I would never reach full decriminalization. I think there are just there are people who are so dangerous and who are so violent that they do need to be incapacitated in some way. But trying to think through who those people are and what the alternatives are for lower level offenders, I think that's what I'm doing now.